So greetings and merry meet. What does your heart tell you about the work that you were meant to do? Well, today's guest researched and wrote a book, The Art of Work, on the topic of vocation and the paths that we might explore to live out our dreams. So I am Dr. Katherine Bingham, the founder of Leadistics, a veteran and woman-owned business that serves executives, entrepreneurs, and professionals to help them elevate their leadership, reinvent, redesign, or pivot, and then really live their life and change the world. I would hope. That's my passion for you. I'm also the author of Driving Pink. But today, the reason we're here is because we have Jeff Goins, who is a best-selling author of The In-Between, Wrecked, You Are a Writer, The Art of Work, and Real Artists Don't Starve. He's also a guacamole aficionado. He hosts the podcast, Hey Creator, and inspires people to step into their creativity and embrace their vocation. So with that, Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Catherine. Good to be with you. Awesome. So I started with this question or idea of vocation. How do you define that? And tell us a bit on the about your journey that led to the work you were meant to do. Yeah, so I mean, vocation uh, literally means calling. Um, and I like to distinguish a vocation from an occupation, mm -hmm. right? So a vocation is is something you might consider your life's work. It's what you were meant to do, why you are here. It is something more than a job. And at times your job, as you understand it, may intersect with your vocation. And at other times in your life, they may seem at odds where you are working as a plumber, but feel like you were meant to be a painter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I like the distinction between vocation and occupation. Vocation is a thing that I'm called to do. An occupation is a thing that occupies my time. And, um, and what I think is really beautiful, or, and what I tried to say in the book, is you think your vocation is this, then you think it's that, then you think it's this, and it is really only something that you understand in retrospect. Mm. Um, you know, so I, I wrote this book in my mid thirties, and um, and and I am audacious enough to say that this is something you don't actually probably understand until you get to the end of your life. Um, but I think I would say it a little bit differently now, which is that a vocation is a thing that you can't not do. It is the work that you keep returning to. And that work could be the work of a homemaker. It could be the work of a dog walker. It could be the work of a potter or, mm -hmm. a, or a computer programmer or a speaker or, you know, whatever. And it is this thing that you just, you keep feeling called back to. Um, I like how Elizabeth Gilbert described her vocation of writing. She said, writing is my home and mm -hmm. it is my home not in the sense that it's the place that I came from, but it's the place that I always return to. And I like that idea of home being a place, not that you necessarily came from, because many of us came from homes that we wouldn't return to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it is the place and space and activity that you keep going back to throughout your life. I would call that your vocation. Awesome. Awesome. You know, Last year, this is staggering, 47.8 million people quit their jobs. It's the highest number ever reported. Wow. And, and so even though you did publish The Art of Work some time back, I think it's really timely today. So what are some of the key themes you feel readers are going to take away if they pick up The Art of Work? So the main idea of the book was that um, your calling is not so much this carefully laid plan that you execute with precision uh, and and clear cut goals that you set and then achieve. Of course, everybody does that, and that's mm -hmm. fine, you know. And it's great to start with a plan. 
Um, but you know, what's that old Mike Tyson quote? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and what I wanted to do with the art of work, it's not the science of work. It's not the blueprint of work. It's the art of work, a proven path. So, you know, if you're wandering around in the woods lost as many people are in their lives and in their work lives, and then you stumble upon a path, right? A well-worn path. You can make a, a certain number of um, conclusions. You could draw a number of conclusions. Uh, one is that uh, somebody was here before me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and in fact, many people uh, seem to have walked this path because you only get a path after many people walk the same way over and over and over again over time. And um, so someone was here before me. Um, many have taken this path. And if I follow it, it's going to lead me somewhere. It's going to, you know, in, in theory, take me out of the woods at some point. And um, and so the book is 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 a series of steps, right? A series of phases that um, happen um, somewhat chaotically. You know, I, this is life we're talking about. This is a life's work. So it's not like seven years for this, seven years for that, seven years for that. But when I surveyed hundreds of people and reflected on my own life and the lives of um you know many people who seem to find a life's work um I, I saw these themes continue to repeat over and over and over again themes like uh, apprenticeship theme mm -hmm. theme themes like um how you find your calling is is a bit of an accident you know it's not how you would expect that was true over and over and over again very few people said this is what i wanted to do since i was three years old it was like well when i was six this thing happened and then i wanted to do this and then i started and then i did this thing for 20 or 40 years and then i came back to this and and that was a pretty normal thing and so what i wanted to do was normalize the chaos of finding a life's work and uh at, at the same time speaking to that feeling of discontent that a lot of us suffer from, which is wherever we are in life, we have this sense that this can't be all there is. There's got to be more. And a lot of people feel that way. And I think that's true. And I think that is a calling, a voice worth responding to. Absolutely. And I love that you related it back to apprenticeship and mastery. We might come back to this in a bit. But I also really appreciated that we don't do it alone. Um, I think I first learned about you. I might have joined Tribe Writers in 2013 or early 2014. Wow. Uh, and, it, and the idea was that there would be this community, right? Mm. So how important is the idea of community in discovering our own art? I think every every story of success is really a story of community. Uh, that's a big theme in the art of work, which is that nobody got here on their own, and and that the self made man or woman or person um, is a myth. It's a story that we tell, and and really it's a it's a conspiracy, right? There there are all mm -hmm. of these people, uh, m many of which don't even know that they're doing it, that are conspiring towards your success. You know, there, there are, you're living a story and there are all of these other stories that are sort of weaving themselves together. Uh, and, and, and that collision of, of people and places and things and ideas results in you here in this moment with all of the tools and resources that you need to take your next step. You know, I, I love that movie Slumdog Millionaire where mm -hmm. he knows every single answer to every single question um, and it's just because life has been preparing him for that exact moment. It just so happened serendipitously that he, uh, a kid from the slums, uh, had a certain set of experiences that that gave him the answers to all of those questions. That is true for your life. You, every experience you have had uh, thus far has um, given you the answers to all of the questions life will ask of you today. Whether you realize it or not, um, everything that has happened to you is preparing you for what's to come. And uh, it feels chaotic. It, it, it feels like things are just happening. And then in retrospect, you look back and sort of connect the dots. 
Uh, and, and I think that's awesome. Um, but you could never say that somebody else didn't play a significant part in your story. You wouldn't be here were it not for other people and vice versa. You're contributing to other people's stories as well. And I think we can accept that with gratitude and humility and, and do our best to pay it forward in some way. You've done a lot intentionally or non-intentionally of mentoring others. Hmm. What's the role some mentors or a mentor has played in supporting your own life and work? I, I do. I, I think I wrote about this. You know, there's the concept in the art of work that I call the accidental apprenticeship. And, and what I did with this book, for whatever it's worth, is is I had this, you know, uh, young, uh, brazen idea that that I knew how this thing worked. And I wrote this this sort of like stilted, um, stale book about how to find your life's work based on my you know experience of you know all thirty five years or whatever maybe thirty three years at that point and um and I I read my own work and I didn't believe it I didn't believe what I was trying to say and I think we you know like anytime you hear somebody who's like really young and really confident and really sure of themselves you're like I don't know about that. And I, I felt that I felt that sense of skepticism towards myself. And so I had these ideas like this is how this works. And I had these seven steps, basically. And I went back and just interviewed like over 400 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I reread a bunch of old biographies, people like Walt Disney. And, um, and and I sort of compared these like stories of what I thought were like great, interesting people who had done really cool stuff with their lives. And and then contrasted them and compared them with like everyday ordinary people whose stories you wouldn't know if I didn't put them in the book. And I, I noticed that that um all of these themes and steps, as I called them, were um were true, but not in the way that I thought. So for example, apprenticeship. Um, you've got to if you want to master something, you want to be great at something. Um, and I I'm a I'm a writer and I'm always trying to become a better writer. And, um, and, and so I understood you've got to train under somebody else, but that's really hard to do as a writer. Um, mm -hmm. most professional writers didn't go to school and, and get a degree in English and, and go get their MFA. Some did, but a, a lot of them just started writing and figured it out as they went, you know, and, and that, that's my story. Uh, and so my whole life, I've been looking for somebody to mentor me as a man. I've been looking for somebody to take me under their wings and apprentice me as a writer. And I've been sort of frustrated by the fact that nobody has done that for me. And then I live a few years and I look back on a certain season of my life where I've experienced some significant growth and transformation. I go, oh, I did. <laughs> I, I did have a mentor. I did have a teacher. I did have a guide. And I didn't know it at the time. And there's mm -hmm. been times in my life where I've gone to somebody and said, will you you mentor me at this thing? And they go, yeah, sure, totally. We meet for coffee twice and the whole thing just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think the best mentorships are the ones that just kind of happen. You know, the best mentor is the one you least expect, the one who mm -hmm. keeps showing up in your life. Um, so I had this idea that all of these things worked like this. And the book is me really going... I have no idea how this works, you know, like apprentice accidental apprenticeships. The idea is, um, you know, we have all heard that um, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, right? Right. Uh, the student's never ready. The student's <laughs> never ready. What that actually, I, I do believe that in a sense, but what that actually means is at your most dire moment, when you have no idea how the heck you're going to take this next step in your life. Um, Cause your life is your work and your work is your life. Right. Um, somebody will show up serendipitously in your life with the key to the door you cannot open and it will feel ordinary. Mm -hmm. It will feel normal and it will be easy to overlook. And these epiphanal moments, these moments of potential epiphany, will keep coming back until you realize what's happening. A friend of mine, an old business coach of mine, Casey Graham, used to say, I believe, he said, I believe that 
life keeps keeps giving you the same tests until you pass them. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you have to keep learning the same lessons. You keep getting the same pop quiz until you go, oh, I need to study for this. I need to know these answers. <laughs> And mentorship is like that. Um, the The worst way to get a mentor is to ask somebody to mentor you. The best way is to look at the people already in your life. The voice is already influencing you. Whether you whether you realize it or they realize it is is irrelevant. Pay attention to who and what is sort of influencing you, and then make it conscious. Right, become intentional about it. Harness that energy. Right, if uh, I, when I bought my first house and started my family, there was this guy down the street that I knew from church who um, uh, gave me his lawnmower, right? And um, and and then when something, he was very handy. He was just, you know, I was I was this kid, I was a kid in my twenties, this dude in his fifties. And when something broke, um, you know, I would sort of like she, like something I don't know, broke in the house that I didn't know how to fix and didn't have the money to hire somebody. I would like sheepishly walk over and he would come over and like patiently help me fix this thing that had broken. And all these things that I didn't really think about, you know, here's what I'm going to have to do when I own my first home. Uh, he was there to help me. And it wasn't like, hey, Chuck, I need a mentor on how to be a <laughs> man. Right. You know, it was like, no, he just... I, I don't know what was going on in his head, but, you know, like as you get a little bit older, you you see where people are at and you can kind of remember what life felt like when you were in that place. And you go, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do what I can to help this person because I got help when mm -hmm. I was this age and I want to I want to pass it along. So I do think the best mentors are the ones who just kind of show up and you should pay attention to the people who come into your life, regardless of age. Right. And understand that. Many of your mentors, um, first of all, you're going to have a multitude of them probably, mm -hmm. and they will come in and out of your life um, in different seasons and they will be hard to recognize. You know, you think of, uh, I think of the movie Star Wars, you know, which is the classic hero's journey story. Um, you know, Luke has two mentors. Uh, one is Obi-Wan Kenobi, whom they call Old Ben. He's a crazy old man, right? And he's like, what does this crazy old man have to teach me? He and he's a sage. You know, later on, Yoda is his is his mentor. But who is Yoda? This weird little Muppet looking dude who, who is super eccentric. He lives in, you know, the swamps. And this is an old trope. This is an the wise, crazy man who's out in the woods somewhere and you've got to go find them that is um an important piece of mythology and wisdom literature that um we ha we have to remember john the baptist crazy dude in the desert jesus mm -hmm. goes to him and and gets gets the 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 anointing to go become the hero right and so if you want a mentor and and we are to believe these stories of old, you are going to have to go to someplace uncomfortable and you are going to have to li listen to the person you want to dismiss because wisdom is always uncomfortable. Um, so it's not just like, you know, your friend that you have coffee with. That's cool. That's fine. But mentorship, true apprenticeship, true the meeting of a master is going to rub you the wrong way. It's going to challenge you to grow. It's not going to be fun. And it's not going to last for the rest of your life, probably. It's going to it's going to be a multitude of people at different seasons who are literally going to give you the tools or the wisdoms that you need to take the next step. I like that. I like that. And I like the concept of discomfort, right? Um, the phrase, fail forward, fail fast, to me, feels like a modern version of if you don't succeed, try, try again, right? Mm -hmm. And so we we actively try, we take risks. And when we do that, it offers us opportunities to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. pivot. And I'm this huge fan of the pivot, which you also write about in the book. So yeah. can you describe the importance of maybe translating failure mistakes to that new awareness or shift in approach to life and work, this this concept of how do we pivot and how do we know that we need to pivot even? 
Right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I take issue with the whole, like, go, 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 try harder, um, you know, school of thought when it comes to success and achievement. Um, because that's not how life works. That's not how evolution works. Um, all of life is based on efficiency, mm -hmm. including your life. Uh, you are always looking for the easiest thing to do. And that's fine. That's good. You know, like I don't want to run uphill all day long. <laughs> you know, my <laughs> body isn't built for that. So, you know, a challenge is a moment. It's not a, a lifestyle for the most of us, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with comfort. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of ease, a season of rest. Um, and, and this is, you know, the, the slightly older version of myself talking that, you know, the younger version of myself who wrote this book a few years ago. Um, but inevitably, you are going to want X and Y is going to happen. You are going to want one thing and the mm -hmm. other thing is going to happen. This is how life works. The poet David White calls this the conversational nature of reality. In a conversation, we're in a conversation right now. You say a thing and I respond to the thing. And then I say a thing and you respond to the thing. We are conversing. And in a conversation, what I want or think is going to happen doesn't exactly happen because there's another participant in it, which is you. And what you want to happen or what you think is going to happen doesn't exactly happen. You don't know exactly what I'm going to say. I don't know exactly what questions you're going to ask. And we don't know exactly where this thing is going to take us. That's life. You are having a conversation with life. And your vocation, you could say, is um, is is like the intermediary <laughs> of that conversation. I think your work is the way that you are trying to make sense of the signals and messages that life is sending to you, right? Mm -hmm. So when Walt Disney was a kid, he was walking across the um, street um, and he was living in Kansas City at the time, I believe. And he was walking across the street in, in the uh, uh, middle of winter in Missouri. And there was a big piece of ice in the middle of the street and he's a kid, you know? So he's like, I'm gonna kick that block of ice. And he kicks the block of ice and the ice doesn't move. And he feels this tremendous feeling of pain surge up his leg. And he looks down at the block of ice and there's um, there's a big long nail sticking out of it, like a horseshoe nail sticking out of it. And the nail has gone through his boot into his toe all the way into the bone. And he falls down screaming and crying. And eventually somebody has to come pick him up and, and take him home. I mean, they put him on a carriage. This is how long ago this was, early 1900s. And um, they gave him a tetanus shot or something, you know, and, and, and he was bedridden for a couple of weeks. And while he was lying in bed, um, he, uh, he, was, he was a young boy, he's 12, 13 years old. Um, we don't really know what happened. What we do know, according to his biographer, is when he got out of, out of that bed as a young, like, teenage boy, he was certain that he was going to be a cartoonist. And what happened, you know, was he visited by an angel? Was he just kind of mulling over his life? Was he responding to the pressures of his father who had put both of his kids to work at a very young age? He was kind of a slave driver, failed entrepreneur. Um, uh, well, you know, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that he didn't do well at school. He was kind of a goof off. Uh, he had very strict parents who wouldn't let him go see the theater or watch movies. And so he would sneak away with his friend to go watch shows at the theater. Uh, he loved comedy. He loved to draw. He loved to entertain his friends. He got in trouble for drawing caricatures of his teachers in school. And here he is not where he planned to be lying in bed with his foot throbbing and he goes, what am I going to do with my life? His brother had already left uh, and 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 had started uh, his own business. And and Walt Disney was trying to figure it out. And so he gets out of that bed and goes, I'm going to be a cartoonist. And he starts dedicating himself to this craft. Um, but then, you know, World War I happens and he, and he joins the Red Cross. And he actually, he's too young. He's like 17 years old. And he makes his mom forge her, you know, like he makes his mom lie basically and say that he's he's a year older than he really is forges um birth date on there and then he goes off and he's an ambulance driver in world war one and and then he actually has a series of failed businesses before he eventually becomes the walt disney we know him as today um and 
what's interesting about that story is um, if the if if things had gone according to plan, we wouldn't have you know the wonderful world of Disney as we know it right, today. Right. And so you know we hear things like failure is not an option, but you use the word opportunity, and I like that. Failure, of course, failure is an option. Failure happens all the time. Failure is not an option; it's an opportunity. And I think what happens is there are there are certain doors that you can't kick down in life, no matter how hard you try. And there are some that you shouldn't try. Mm -hmm. And so when you find yourself heading towards a destination and 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 the road is a dead end, um, don't be afraid to turn around, backtrack a few miles, find the latest fork and take the other way. Um, you know, I do love that Mark Twain quote, you know, when, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Most of us think that failure is wrong or bad instead of just, you know, if we failed at something, it was a failure to predict how this was going to turn out. It's not mm -hmm. that we, we didn't succeed, right? It's that we thought we were going to do this and instead we did that, Right. Walt Disney did not want a giant nail stuck in his foot, um, but that gave him the space that provided the revelation for him to be become what he became. And so it's hard. I don't like failure. It doesn't feel good. I don't like th thinking I'm going to crush this goal and this goal instead crushes me. I don't like having to sort of collect myself and try again. And every failure has informed me of something that I was doing wrong. Every failure has been a pivot point in my life that is slowly guiding me towards this thing that I will call my life's work that I won't fully understand until I get to the end of it. And so, you know, should we celebrate failure? Look, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wanna encourage my kids to do their best and try really hard. And I wanna be with them when life knocks them down and I want to mm -hmm. teach them how to be strong and also to feel their feelings and listen, listen to your life. Uh, this is kind of the theme of the whole book is you are having a conversation with life and the vehicle for that conversation is this thing called your calling. It mm -hmm. is a voice. It is, it is a, um, <laughs> it is a, it is a thing that you are uh, working with and participating in, and it's giving you feedback as you go. Failure is the best form of feedback because it tells you that you are wrong about something. And then you've got to figure out what you were wrong about. Did I not try hard enough? Did I, did I not try in the right way? Or maybe this isn't the right thing for me and I need to make a dramatic turn in the other direction. Now, I don't, I, I don't like failing and I don't easily give up. So if I come to a big boulder in the road, I'm going to try to climb over it or move around it or push it out of the way. Um, so there's lots of choices when we hit with these pivot points, these points of failure. Um, but you de like the one choice you can't make is that you give up. You just stop and sit there and, you know, decide that you're not going to go on anymore. There's no shame in turning around and trying to find another way. There's no shame in trying harder and climbing over it, but find a way to work with it. See what the failure can teach you. Cause there was something that you got wrong and that's wonderful. That's a wonderful lesson. It's good to get things wrong on the test because that's how you learn, um, not it just by memorizing. Insight. Yeah, it's not just heart. by memor memorizing all the answers. I like that. I like that. You mentioned feedback a moment ago. I want to take that that trigger for myself and ask the people who are watching or listening a question. So I always ask a question, folks. You know this if you're subscribed. So here's your question for this session. What are you meant to do? And it's totally okay to say that you're still discovering whatever your dream is. And if you need help with that, let us know. Put your thoughts down in the comments, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are you meant to do? And if you, again, let us know if you know that already. I read each comment. I will respond to you. It's great because the system gives me a little reminder that says, hey, somebody posted something. Jeff, while they um, take a moment to put their thoughts in, let me ask you another question. What is next? I mean, you've done a lot of things. You've, you know, I've been watching some shift in the, 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 the emails that you send out. So 
what are you thinking your next thing is? Well, um, I want to go back to that question. What are you meant to do? Which might spoil the answers that people um, leave. <laughs> um, my um, experience of that question is that most people don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think it is so much better to ask the question than have the answer. Because every answer you have is 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 not an adequate expression of what you are and, and what you will be. And so vocation is how we dance with our own being, our own selfhood, yes. right? Like like our whatever you want to, how whatever words you want to use, your soul, your your spirit, your you know, your connection to the divine, or or just like you spending some time on this, you know planet trying to figure out um how am i going to spend my time because i got to spend it doing something <laughs> um i think it's wonderful to not know because even if you think you know you're probably wrong and i think it's wonderful to have a direction right mm -hmm. so i don't know what's next uh, but okay i too. but i do know um uh i do know that i'm willing to take a step and I think the problem, and I do write about this in the book, I think the problem is we often think that if we don't know what we should do, we shouldn't do anything. Um, now, I, I think if you don't know what to do, you probably shouldn't run 100 miles an hour. Right. You should slowly start stepping into some directions and see what happens, right? Um, and it is an act of faith and trust. Um, so, I, you know, what's next for me? Um, I, I know it's not next for me. Um, what's not next for me is another 10 years of toiling to achieve something that I already have. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I know what's not next is believing that any semblance of success brings any semblance of happiness whatsoever. Um, and that my work is more of a game, more of a race that I get to pick, you know, like uh, I get to run my own race. I get to play my own game. I don't have to play by other people's rules because there are no rules. Um, it is interesting to me how many successful people I know who don't consider themselves a success. And so that is entirely subjective. And so if you want to be a success, you really are playing this game with yourself in your mind. And mm -hmm. you've got some ideal of what that looks like. And it could be an ideal of goodness or um, legacy or skill or mastery or kindness or whatever. And um, so many of us are playing like an unwinnable game because we keep changing the, the scorecard. You know, we keep going, no, no, it's not that it's this it is, you know, and like we keep kind of raising the stakes and that's fine. If you know, you're playing a game and it's terrible if you're judging and condemning yourself for never crossing the finish line, never winning the game. Um, so I, I hope in this next season of creative work, you know, next another decade or so um, that I can be a little bit more playful. You know, I'd love to have a little bit more, a little, a little, a little more poetry, a little less prose, mm. a little more narrative, a little less advice, a little more. I don't know. Let's ask, let's explore the question together instead of coming at the world with all my answers. I just don't, I don't believe self-help literature anymore i know these people they're making it up and and they're they are they they they, they they're they're extracting lessons and uh, from they're extracting experiences that are cherry picked from their own life and from the lives of others they're extrapolating those into these big overarching lessons and themes and those are just ideas they're not real they're they're not truth they're just an idea now an idea can lead you to the truth but the truth is this here now, what we're experiencing, you know, everything else is just um, is is like a concentrated, boiled down, uh, you know, um, powdered, you know, pulverized version of it. Right. Like think of like powdered milk or something like it's like this is the truth. It's like, no, that's like a really refined, easy to just add water kind of, you know, and that's what advice is. Um, so. You know, I'll do some things and and figure it out and learn as I go, and and I hope I do it with a certain amount of fear and trembling and and 
uh, respect for the, uh, the all the things that I, I don't know are going to happen because I, I look forward to those surprises instead of trying to like manufacture the best life. I'm, I am eagerly and anticipating and awaiting some um, some things that I didn't know were going to happen that I might call failure at the time and, and they will be just more more grist for the mill, more fodder for um, this calling that I'm still discovering as I live it out. And and you mentioned legacy as you talked about that because you have legacy in the book as well. But I liked right. that you took legacy, and I think the words you used um, were more about the uh, what we leave behind as a result of our life and work. But then you pair it with the concept of the letting go, right? Mm -hmm. That um, I think there is the story. Um, Tolkien around the guy who wants to paint a tree and at the end he has the leaf and the branch but he passes on in his journey and then the tree is done mm -hmm. right the mm -hmm. tree was done after the right and, it, and so the idea of just letting go of what you think and I think that's what I'm hearing you describe is it that in in your journey you've let go of some of the earlier ideas and you still leave the legacy behind all of the things that you've contributed are there for people to take in and appreciate learn from or not you know use as a jumping point right but we don't we don't have to get to all of our end results and we have and it's I think it's easier if we if we don't feel like we have to get to it all because we do need the play we need the relationships we need the other pieces of our gift I, I liked um Sam Sam was his name in Uganda oh yeah and you know, that his work, you know, by all Western ideas, he lives a very different life and he farms and he um, works to create things that he can sell. And he's doing it because he, he wants a better life for his children and his family. And he stayed with his family. Now, the reason that that was... I, that really stuck with me as I have a colleague who actually has a mission in Uganda. And so he wrote the book, We Are Not Mahogany. And it is very common as you wrote about Sam, that he is an anomaly in that he stayed with his family and he's committed to his family and that his legacy is just is going to be much more profound before because of what he has put into it. Mm. But that doesn't mean, you know, I don't know what it doesn't mean. <laughs> but the idea, I just, I liked the, the pairing of both. Yes, we can strive for things. We can practice our art. We can do many things and we might have these really audacious goals to go after but as we come to our conclusion, maybe there's other elements that give our life more meaning and and we can let go of some of the other things that we had beforehand. Yeah, um, I actually forgot about Sam. You know, he was a, a farmer that I met in Uganda when I was there on a, a blogging trip with uh, Compassion International. We were raising money for orphans and and, and children's programs there. Um and um, he was a poor farmer in rural Uganda in the bush, and he was rich. Mm -hmm. He was he was very wealthy. Um, he had his own business. He sold uh, little bags of olive oil on the side of the road, and um, and he was building a house um, out of brick, which is a big deal. And um, he took me into his shed and he showed me his plan mm -hmm. and how much money 
he had to make every single day and how much money he was making every day. He was keeping record of all of it. And at which point he'd be able to finish his family's house. Because right now they were just kind of living in these little like tent type structures, little like clay structures. Um, and um, I was like, I believed him. He had a goal. Uh, he was committed to it and he was measuring the progress. And it was that was a very different experience uh, from when I went to Kampala uh, and I went to what is called, you know, one of the most dangerous slums in the world. It's this huge slum in the middle of of, uh, of, of Kampala, the capital of Uganda. Um, and uh, a lot of people moved to the city from the bush, from the country, um, in, in, in looking for jobs. You know, and I met this woman who had AIDS and she had three or four children and, um, and, and she had moved to the city, you know, in hopes of, of getting a job. And she was, you know, pretty full of despair. Um, you know, she'd been raped multiple times and, um, you know, she was living with AIDS and wasn't probably going to live much longer. And, um, I mean, life had just really not gone well for her and um and 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 they told us they said there are different kinds of poverty you know and um this woman had come to the city in hopes of a better life and had gotten a much worse life mm -hmm. and um you know poverty i think is really um, and this is, you know, me saying it from a very privileged position, but but I do think um, the worst kind of poverty is when you are out of choices, right? You 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 have nothing. You cannot choose um, any other life for yourself, or you feel that way. Um, this was th that was not the case for Sam. He was out in, in you know seemingly in the middle of nowhere, and he had to walk a mile to get fresh water, and that was no big deal. Like I. Like he was happy, he was mm -hmm. good, and he had a lot of agency over his life. Um, so what does that mean when it comes to legacy? Um, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, the plans that you have for life are not going to work out the way you think they are, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, and the legacy that you want to leave is probably not the legacy that you are going to leave. And if you want to know what kind of legacy you're going to leave, look at your life right now. Annie Dillard has this wonderful quote. She says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. So you want to know what your legacy? You don't need to know. It's not a mystery. It's happening right now. Right? Now. right? Did you give up some time with that special someone in your life to work an extra hour? That's your legacy. I'm not judging it. I, I've done it and I do it, you know, and, and sometimes it's necessary. But that's your legacy. That's one brick right now going into this thing that you're building. Um, I also think legacy is ego. I don't care about it. I don't care who remembers me. I don't care what they say at my funeral. I'm not interested. I'm not going to be there. What I'm interested in is what are they saying now? What is my relationship to these people now? If I'm living for for you know somebody to name a building after me when I'm gone, what the hell am I doing? It's ridiculous. Right. right. I I should be expending my life as best I can right now in the service of of things that I think are are worthy of it, that are good yes. and true and noble. Yes. Um, and as a friend of mine says, we all die unfinished symphonies. You yes. will go to the grave with work unfinished, with goals not completed. Every writer who has ever lived was, you know, usually working on a book when they died. That was like, it po it's published posthumously and it's not that good because they didn't finish it, you know? <laughs> um, that's great. You should be doing that. You should be working as if you have all the time in the world. Um, and no time at all, right? You should be, uh, you know, what is the line from Hamilton? You know, write like you're running out of time. And, um, and and one day you will run out of time. And that's fine. My challenge in the book is, so live your life and pursue your mission, your goal, your vocation, your life's work, whatever you want to call it. The thing that you're trying to do as best that you understand it right now, pursue that in such a way where it invites other people to be a part of it. Because at some point, you're not going to be able to finish this. You're going to have to pass the baton. Welcome to life. We're all 
participating in this thing where we inherited something from somebody else and we get to pass something on to somebody. The, the, the story that I use in the book is um, when I was in college, I was a part of a, a, a handful of people at our school, and I went to a small liberal arts school in Illinois called Illinois College. It was the first college founded in Illinois, so they got to call it Illinois College. Um, and um, we wanted to start the, the first honor code, which it would be a student-run code of conduct that would um, – uh, you know, sort of provide consequences for things like plagiarism and cheating and stuff. And it would be, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be the administration or faculty doing it. It would be, the, you know, the student body. Um, and and most prestigious schools uh, have an, an honor code and, and a board for that. We did not. And it took me and a couple of other people like three years to make this happen. And the last week of school while I'm a graduating senior, they, the, we had to go before the faculty and present this uh, petition to them that we had spent years getting signatures for. And like, I was like, I never want to work in government because it was just, <laughs> it, it, it was like that. It felt, it was very, it was politicking and I hated it. I was like, I had to shake hands and kiss babies and, uh, you know, uh, convince all the, I mean, I remember like spearheading this and I had a student come up to me at lunch and he goes, hey, I saw that you're doing this thing. This big wrestler, jock dude, guy I knew. We're friendly acquaintances. And he goes, <clears throat> he goes, but he goes, like, let's say, you know, he goes, you know, I, I work. This is this is the cornfields of Illinois, right? He goes, you know, we have this family farm and my brother and I work it. And da, da, da. I go, yeah, I, I know you've got a farm. Um, yeah. So like I come to class and then go to the farm and work on the farm. <clears throat> and he said, um, so let's say I write a paper, you know, and like. I, I, I like copy and paste some stuff from the internet, um, you know, and I kind of like rearrange it, you know, but I don't like cite that. Like, is that like, that's okay. Right. And I was like, no, dude, that's not okay. That's plagiarism. And he's like, yeah, but I'm like really busy. I don't have time to do that. And I kind of like turn it into my own words. I go, no, dude, like you didn't get that idea. You got that idea from somebody else. You just have to say, I got this idea from somebody else. And I put it in my own words. That's that's citing your sources. That's plagiarism. I'm sorry, man. That would be something that um, you know would go before the board. It would be a violation of this honor code. And he's like, "Well, I don't think that's cool at all." And like, it was like that. I was like having yeah. to convince people you can't cheat just because you're busy. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> yeah. And um, long story short, long story long, <laughs> the end of a long story, I should say, is. Um, we got we got the the faculty to finally agree to it, and it was the last week of school, and I had to leave. Like I I I couldn't see this thing get carried out, and and there was this sophomore named Josh, and I said to Josh, I go, you got to do it now, man. Like it's come yours. out, <laughs> and and he to be fair, he had the harder job. He had to build the honor board and kind of institute all this stuff, and several years later, actually. Uh, right after the art of work came out um, a year or two later, I went back and spoke at my college and because they, they wanted to pay me to come speak. And I was like, I will take back as many dollars that I gave to you in tuition as possible, <laughs> yes. uh, which uh, I didn't get many of them back, but still I'll take them. <laughs> and, um, and I, I spoke uh, before I, I spoke to the whole, uh, um, student body or whoever wanted to come to the convocation, you know, um, I went to a, a writing class because one of my old uh, friends with my writing professors and she invited me back. She's like, yeah, hey, you know, one of my students became a, an author. I'd love to have him come speak to the class. And I went and spoke to the class and on the wall in a little like framed thing on the wall was the honor code that I wrote that, you know, and lots of people contributed, but you know, it was, it was one of the things that I spearheaded and that was cool. That was interesting. You know, that was really neat to see something that I created there, you know, like mm -hmm. and nobody, nobody knew I didn't say by Jeff Goins, you know, nobody knew. <laughs> um, and, and it wasn't really me. It was a bunch of people right. and, right. and it wasn't even my idea. It was somebody else's idea. And my friend Dan kind of started it. And then he handed it off to me because he went and did a study abroad thing. And then I went and did a study abroad thing. And then, and then we graduated and then this guy named Josh had to like carry it out afterwards. And it became this whole other thing. Um, and I think that's great. Like, I think it's, it's wonderful when you get to see, 
you know, the fruit, but that's rare. It, yeah, it is rare. And, 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 and you have no control over that. You know, I love that, mm -hmm. um, that, that other line in Hamilton, you know, where um, George Washington says to Alexander Hamilton, you know, you basically have no control over who tells your story and what they mm -hmm. say about you, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. It's not, you don't have control over that. What you have control over is you. Can you be a good person today? As far as you understand that, um, you want to know what your legacy is. Look at your life right now. That's a pretty good picture of what you're going to leave behind. And if you're proud of that, keep doing that. If there are things that you could do better, which is true for all of us, then work on those things. That's the legacy you're creating. What people remember, what they say about you, that's not your business. I love that. I love that. So thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank everyone who has taken the time to listen to our conversation today. Um, please do subscribe to the channel so you know when the next awesome convo hits the feed and we will continue to talk about leadership and how to live for today, not someday. Here are a few ways that you can reach out to Jeff. You can visit his website. It's goinswriter.com. That's G-O-I-N-S writer.com. And you can also find links on there to his podcast, Hey Creator, uh, Jeff's Twitter's Twitter and Instagram handles are at Jeff Goins. And you can purchase his book from the author page link that I am going to be adding into our session description today. So in that one link, you'll be able to get to all of the pages that I listed or the books that I listed at the beginning of the conversation. So we very much appreciate that you have some taken some time with us. Jeff, I thank you again. And with that, I just want to encourage all of you to go forth and do great things. Thanks so much. Thanks, Catherine.